So um, I'd like to share uh, uh, with you uh, uh, Car Carrie's bio. Carrie is the executive director of the Election Integrity Network, and she they flew her in all the way from Florida for this day for this presentation. So it's extremely special. And uh, Lynn Taylor is having a knee or hip surgery just, hip just a couple of days ago. So, great. so uh, she really wanted to be here, and uh, but uh, so she found her best and brightest and flew her all the way in from Florida. So we're so grateful. Uh, Carrie is the executive director of the Election Integrity Network, a project of the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. She also serves as a senior fellow for the Frontiers of Freedom and the Institute for Liberty and the senior advisor to the Florida Fair Elections Coalition. And you have her, um, you have her bio in your folder, so I'm not going to read her entire bio, but I just want to begin with a quote from, since we've been uh, hearing some quotes from Joseph Stalin today, I'd like to preface your presentation with this quote from Joseph Stalin. I'm assuming it's from the 30s. I don't know exactly the date, but it says about voting in elections. Those who vote decide nothing. Those who count the vote decide everything. Oh. The Democrats learned oh. that well. Let's give Carrie a very warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. All right, so this is better giving a speech during lunch than after lunch, because after lunch everybody's kind of, you kind of lose people. All right, so let's start off by talking about your high school graduation, right? So how many of you remember your high school graduation? This is interactive. Raise your hand. All right. How many of you remember your high school graduation speaker? Yeah, so I have four best friends from high school. We had to go find our yearbook to figure out who ours was. And how many of you remember what they said? Okay, so I have a magic trick to start us out with right at the moment. Um, I can actually tell you what your graduation speaker said. They said three things. Number one, be your authentic self, which was maybe not the greatest idea in the world to tell an 18-year-old. And as the kids would say today, you be you. But I guarantee you that was in there. Number two, 100%, go make a difference. Go change the world. Go make a difference. Go do something. Number three, live your life according to your values and your principles. Um, I, we discovered that uh, my graduation speaker was a Jesuit um, professor from Boston College who uh, was a big liberal. So I'm not sure. I'm glad it didn't sink in, whatever it was he actually said. Um, I know that's a seemingly random reference, um, but now I have another one. And if, Michael, if you would. Okay, so before I go into the other seemingly random reference, um, anyone here who has served in the military? Could you raise your hand and we'll just say thank you? So these are my two sons. The taller of the two is an army captain. The shorter of the two um, is a recent um, uh, second lieutenant in the United States Air Force. Both my sons are Liberty graduates in 2015. Um, Mitchell, this one came a little bit later in life, um, but still, still my boys. Um, so last weekend, Mitchell graduated from Liberty University with his MBA. He did ROTC, uh, got his MBA, did ROTC, um, and the ex next day he was commissioned again into the Air Force as a second uh, lieutenant. I would like to read to you the oath that both Connor and Mitchell took when they became military officers, and it goes like this. I do solemnly swear and affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to same, and that I take this obligation freely without mental reservation or purpose of, engage, of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties as an officer of the blah, blah, blah branch upon which I am, and there's a lot of d debate between the two of them, which one's right, um, about which I am to enter, so help me God. So, so where am I going with all of this? Well, just, just keep in mind your high school graduation and the oath that these boys just took. Um, so why are we all here? Uh, more to the point, uh, why are you here? Um, the wonder, this wonderful conference is definitely a leadership summit. If you're sitting here, you're in leadership. If you're in leadership, God bless you, you paid attention to your high school graduation. You are living an authentic, patriotic citizen life in every way. You're concerned about the direction of our nation. That is who the authentic you is. You are making a difference. So, how big is a difference? 
uh, it's as big as the one you're making. That's what it is. Whether it's in your local community, in your political life, in your personal life, as you model for others, particularly young people. Uh, we can't all be president or governor, but we absolutely can make a difference. You are sitting here, so it is a given that you are making a difference. <coughs> you are living your life according to your values and your principles. Let me just assume that I know what a, a, a number of those are. It's kind of another, it's kind of another magic trick. Um, our rights come from God. No man or government can take them away, hard as they might try. Those rights are always your rights, even when you cannot exercise them. If the government took them and stuck a big rock on them and threw them into the mi middle of the Mariana Trench, they would still be your rights. Government is not the solution. Government is the problem. Government shouldn't do well what it shouldn't do at all. And individual liberty trumps any kind of government blob all day long. Free enterprise works. Free markets work. Perfectly? No. But every American should be free to chase after prosperity by hard work and education and dedication. No agency, legislator, executive branch, or left-wing lunatic should ever be able to stand between you and the prosperity that you seek. Which brings us to election integrity. Um, as the military oath says, we have to protect ourselves from enemies, foreign and domestic. And we do have those, both. Um, we see them both in election integrity world. Um, they are trying to cause chaos and disruption in our election systems, and they've actually done a really darn good job of it. Several years ago, left-wing billionaires had a revelation, which is always a frightening thought. Um, they realized that instead of funding individual candidates, they could fund an entire movement to manipulate the elections of outcome, election outcomes in their favor, not by funding politicians, by, by influencing and changing the process by which we count votes. We saw it in 2020 when after the November election, we all looked at each other and we said, what was that? Something just happened. Can we take it to court? I don't know. But something weird's going on. And we all kind of woke up. We weren't really sure. In fact, I, I, I often argue that we we're actually the woke people, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, out of that disaster, Kalita Mitchell, who is a longtime and well-respected election attorney, many of you may be familiar with Kalita, <coughs> excuse me, started the Election Integrity Network. The goal was to provide a platform for citizen patriots to engage in participating in their elections. It's where grassroots, grass, grass tops, and just regular people who heretofore were not even remotely interested in politics came together to ensure that elections are administered according to law and that sunlight is shining on local election officials, which they hate, and to make sure resources, we became resources to those local officials. At roughly the same time, Lynn Taylor, who was president of the Virginia Institute for Public Policy, was doing something similar in Virginia, where we're standing today. In an effort to ensure fair, accurate, and secure elections, Lynn and her team created what we now call and is known in the election integrity movement as the Virginia model, which is everyone leaves their logos at the door and comes together to protect elections. Uh, she and her team organized poll watchers, visited election offices, and miraculously worked with the RNC state director, a wonderful young man named Thomas Lane, to make sure that when there was an issue at the polls, a, a lawyer was actually on the end to answer the questions. Because before, when you called for help, it was ring, ring, ring. Sorry, there's no one here to answer your call. Um, you may, so a little anecdote, just again for, for Virginia. Uh, you may remember, remember in 2021, we were all told we were still having to wear masks. Um, we bought, we, during the, that election process in Virginia, we get a whole bunch of phone calls from precinct chairs and poll workers all over, uh, watchers from all over the Commonwealth who said they're telling people they can't vote unless they have a mask on. And we went ring, 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 and Thomas answered the phone. It went up the flagpole. The flagpole called the governor's office, who at that point was uh, Governor Northam. And the next thing you know, um, a directive came out from the governor's office to say to every single precinct and every single election official in the county or city, the units here, um, yes, people can vote without masks. And, and who do you think most of the maskless were, right? So let me just mention that government, Governor Yunkin won that election, so there you go. So that showed to us that the Virginia model really works. Um, Cleta and Lynn worked together from the beginning um, after the 2020 election. 
uh, in January of that year, EIN, of last year, EIN merged into the Virginia Institute, and it is now one of our major projects. Uh, Cleta remains the founder um, and is still very engaged. Lynn is the chairman, and I'm the executive director. So a little bit of, of, about I, EIN, because that's what they pay me to do. Uh, what we do, and more, most importantly, how it's a reflection of the entire election integrity movement. When we first started nearly four years ago, actually, I got a phone call from Kalita. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Carrie, are you busy? No, nah, not really. Well, now it's like 60-hour work week, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of busy now. But when, when he first started this, I j kind of joked to Kalita. I said, you know, election integrity is an issue. We need to turn it into a movement, like the school choice movement, like the pro-life movement, and I feel like we've really and truly done that. Uh, we do a lot of things. We all have about 50,000 hats. Some of them we put on ourselves. Some of them people toss on our heads, and either is fine. But we fundamentally do two things at EIN. One is our state coalitions, which is over here the coalition side, and then we have these national working groups, which are over here the policy side. Um, our national working groups educate and engage citizens from across, across the country on the policy stuff. Um, and the state coalitions we have, and we cover about half the states now, including Virginia and whatever state you're in. So see me afterwards if you would like to join one of them. Uh, they are Zoom calls once a week. Uh, they are very interactive and they get an awful lot of work done. Uh, it's not a knitting and chatting session. Uh, real hard, very deliberate work gets done that uh, I could quantify for you in any state that you might live in. Um, I could give you anecdote after anecdote about that, but I'd be here all day. But that's the good news. Um, these these uh, coalitions range in size. Uh, the one in Florida is 50-ish, 60 people a week. We have about 200 that come on the calls, 50 or 60 a week. Rhode Island, I love to tell a Rhode Island story. Little tiny Rhode Island. Rhode Island has 12 people in their coalition. Those 12 people have killed five bad bills in the Rhode Island legislature this year by opening their mouths and asking the questions and talking about the realities. I joke with them, they've each killed 2.4 bills each. Um, they've, they've just done a miraculous job. So it's not so much in our coalitions the size of them, it's the work that the people put in. We have 10 national working groups. I'm not going to go into gross detail. Uh, the most important one, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute right now, is our only citizens vote national working group. We have Citizens Research Project, which is uh, researching the left-wing infiltration in our election offices. Vote by mail in the USPS. Uh, our uh, gentleman who runs the, that one always jokes that the post office is the country's largest precinct and there's no poll observers, and that's true. What do you do with the absentee, with the ballots you get back and they're undeliverable? Oh, we just put them in the trash can on the back where everybody can grab them. Yeah, no, great. So we have a legislative working group. We have voter roll cleanup, election technology. That's a spicy one, let me tell you. Uh, election audits stop ranked choice voting, building local task forces and vulnerable voters. Uh, once a month, I do a media training class where we kind of roll through all the various lanes of media training and a newbie class. So if anyone is interested in any of those, please come see me. We would be delighted to have you. Uh, one of the things we give to the people on the calls are, 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 are other people. So uh, we work with a number of national groups and experts and leaders and state leaders as well from the political side as from the policy side who provide insight and information um, on these calls because these folks would normally not be exposed to these people. So it's a wonderful opportunity for them. Um, if you're interested, and I'm chuckling, I, this is actually funny because you don't know this is in my speech. <coughs> um, our website is whoscounting.us or who's counting us, <coughs> which we thought would be a funny stick in the eye to Joseph Stalin, who again famously said it's not who's it's voting, it's who's counting the vote. So please come visit us at who's counting us. Uh, so anyway, so enough about Election Integrity Network, as wonderful as it is, and it is wonderful. Um, let's talk about the broader election integrity issues and uh, where they lie. And I want to make one super observation based on something that I think Frank said about the line about the consent of the governed. And I, and I do say this a lot. I, for, I forgot about it for today until you brought it up. The way we either provide or withdraw our consent to anything the government does is voting. So you hear about the consent of the government and, oh, well, the governed, and it sounds like a wonderful phrase, but realize that that's your voting rights. That's, that's where that magic happens. Um, to note, there are two issues, whenever you're talking about election integrity, there's two sides. 
there's the law and the statute over here, and there's the process over here. So keep that in mind, law over here, process over there. Um, some states have good laws, some states have terrible laws, but um, I will remind you of this. We're in, we're in Virginia, so I'm going to talk about Virginia. Elections don't happen in Richmond. They don't happen in your state capital. They don't happen in D.C. They happen up the street from you in your election office. So if you want to make a change, you go visit those lovely people in your election office. I have people say to me all the time, my election officer hates me. And I, I say the same thing in return. They're the only one you have. You, you got to work with them. You have to be a resource and not a mosquito that they have to keep swatting. But that's where the action happens and that's what we do at EIN. We actually teach people, we give pieces of paper to people to take to the election office to become um, engaged. Because a lot of them don't honestly, uh, they're making innocent mistakes very often. They don't have the time, the staff or the budget to really do the work that they need to do. That's again where we come in as citizen patriots. So what are the domestic threats in general? Well, the left wing. I mean, what more can I say? I can, I can leave now. Um, one of the challenges is to un anticipate what kind of mayhem they are going to create next. And I have to tell you, we all do a terrible job at this, a very poor job, because we don't think like they do. Right? So we don't sit around and think, what lie and deceit can we proffer next? So it's a little bit different. It's, it's you know, the old game of whack-a-mole is a little bit uh, challenging, but we do our best. So the threats to election integrity come from three basic areas. The federal, the state, and the local. Um, there's a myriad of reasons for all of those, um, so I'm just going to highlight a few. To me, the most important federal challenge that we have, it, and if you're not familiar with this, you should look it up, is Biden's executive order 14019, which he issued right about 10 minutes after he was inaugurated. Um, that um, executive order says, and of course I'm paraphrasing, but it says that if any person approaches any federal agency, both in the state, in the capital or in a state, for any kind of assistance, you must ask them, federal bureaucrat, whether they are registered to vote. So imagine you're me last year trying to work your way through Social Security, and you're calling for help, and the first thing they ask you is, uh, are you registered for vote? Or you're a veteran looking for be benefits. Or maybe you are calling HHS, your local HHS, because you're down on your luck and you need Section 8 housing. They're going to ask you if you can register, if you're registered to vote. Inherent in that is this. Are you registered to vote? Because my boss really wants to know. What, what is that help that you need? I mean, that's horrible. It's unconstitutional, inarguably so. We're looking for somebody withstanding on that, but it's horrible. Let me also mention this one, and, and you're all going to die when I say this. It applies to illegal immigrants. The Border Patrol has been instructed and I, I am saying this really off the cuff and off the record. I have a friend who is a Border Patrol agent. He works in the Rio Grande. His heart is so in his work. And he said to me very sarcastically, um, first we give them a blanket, and then we give them a voter registration form. So just think about that. Um, the state threat is bad. Um, you know, here in Virginia, we have terrible laws. F 45 days of early cheating. Ballot, ballot harvesting to infinity and beyond, and a ham sandwich could vote in Virginia as long as it had a utility bill. That's the case in a lot of states. In, where I live in Florida, we're a lot better off. Um, but, you know, you, you have to really look at what your state laws are because, again, federalism. So the federal government says you're going to have an election on this day at, um, and, and supposedly count it on this day and supposedly not have 45 days of early cheating. Um, but you know, that's kind of the way it goes, and every state has its own very much, um, has its, very, its own statutes that govern the administration of, of election procedures. So, even though state laws are very different in regard to voting procedures, the problems are usually the same, which is why we developed these national working groups after time, because we realized that this was really something that people needed. Um, I'd say the top concerns nationwide are voter rolls, if you come from a state with bad voter rolls, don't feel alone, everybody does. Ballot trafficking, how many ballots can somebody bring to a box that aren't theirs in Virginia? 19 million is a good number. You know, it's really bad. It's terrible. 
Um, and then, of course, the machines are always a concern for people. And now the biggest uh, threat that we see emerging is the non-citizen voting, foreign nationals voting. Um, at the local level, the biggest threat is, to, is election officials who are not carrying out elections according to law. And again, this is where we as citizen activists can really make a difference. Just get in there. Just start. Just get in there, ask questions, be nice, ask for a tour the first time you go, provide resources to them. And when I say resources, I mean literally print off pieces of paper. We tell our people to be clipboard warriors. If you're going in there to explain to an election official that they're not um, adhering to the statute, print the bloody thing out and bring it with you so that they can see it. Um, always be right and polite. We are the right and polite people all day long. And give them a heliophobia. Does anyone know what heliophobia is? It's fear of sunshine. So I always say there's the thing you want and then there's them knowing you're looking. And never ever poo-poo the power of their knowing you're watching. It is a huge power even if you don't necessarily, whether it's legislation or procedure, get the thing you want. You make them very nervous when they know you're looking. Um, so who's behind the threat to our national elections? Uh, we are gifted with a number of left-wing billionaires who think elections and election offices are just as for sale as their Ferraris and their jets and their yachts. Um, let me just start with George Soros. Maybe we could end there as well. Um, in addition to the other awful things he does, um, like buying green tents, I'm sure you all know what I mean, he throws a lot of money at the Arabella Network. Remember the Arabella Network. It is the left's dark money cave where freedom goes to die. Um, it has its hand in everything nefarious in election integrity world. Uh, absolutely everything, from the big organizations to the little tiny pop-up grassroots group that pop up miraculously to fight something good and then disappear just as quickly. Um, it would be a lot for me to dive into the Arabella Network, but if you're interested and you're brave enough, uh, my friend Scott Walter, who um, is the president of Capital Research Center, has just uh, published a great book called Arabella, Dark Money, the Network of Leftist Billionaires Transforming America. I kind of argued with him. I'm like, transforming? How about destroying? He's like, ah, I don't know. That's a little rough. But um, it's a great book, so think about that. Um, other left-wing fun funders of election anarchy are Pierre Omidyar of eBay. So every time you go to eBay, you're funding election disruption. That's torture, I know. Uh, John Lewis of Progressive Insurance, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, the American Federation of Teachers, there's a shock, the Kellogg Foundation, don't buy cornflakes anymore, and the Buffett Foundation. Um, none of these are probably a surprise to any of you, but here's where the foreign enemies, remember we talked about enemies foreign and domestic. This is new and it's going to get worse. There is this guy, this guy's name is Hans-Jörg Wies, that's W-Y-S-S. Hans Wies, Wies is a uh, Swiss billionaire and a leftist and a Marxist and all, all the other things. And he found a loophole in our laws. Our law says that no foreign citizen can provide cash to either um, PACs or candidates directly. But there's no such constraint against funding uh, uh, nonprofits, nonpartisan nonprofits, um, including those who overtly influence our elections. Mr. Wies has given an estimated at least $30 million to these nonprofits, and somewhat nonplussed by uh, U.S. law, because he lives in Switzerland anyway, um, he has also given money to liberal PACs and candidates in the past. Um, the government's gone after him, but again, he's having a fun time in, in Switzerland and not planning to visit here apparently anytime soon. Rumor is, so this is where it gets worse, that he is now a left-wing bundler for other left-wing European elites who fly around in private planes while demanding the EU push a carbon tax on America, which he's a big fan of, ostensibly because of polar bears and flooded basements, but really because um, he wants a favorable playing field for European businesses. So you can see why he and his left-wing friends in Europe are, are trying to influence this. Um, some of the organizations, just to mention if you ever see them, Democracy Fund, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, the Center for Election Excellence, doesn't that sound great? Yeah, no. Uh, Cities Forward and the 1630 Fund, because 1620 was already taken. Um, you know, it's just a mess. So let's talk about non-citizen voting. Uh, a little bit. And I'm going to start <clears throat> one, one quick line about the, the, the most horrible part of this. Just think about this for a minute. In many localities, uh, local election officials are allowing foreign nationals to vote in elections, our elections. So picture this. D.C., Chinese Communist Embassy personnel 
voting in our elections. Today, they can do it. Russian nationals at the Russian embassy, our elections, they can do it. Pretty soon, DC is going to let them work as poll watchers. So isn't that fun? So this is why we need to kill this thing per permanently. Um, this is one of those things we talk about in public policy where we often say, I can't believe we're having this conversation. How is it that we're having this conversation? How is it that foreign nationals can vote here? You know, Italians only vote in Italy. In, in Canada, only Canadians vote. Like, why would anybody even think that this would happen here? Um, qu quick story. Um, in 2014, uh, a scholarly journal reported that 6% of citizens, 2014, 10 years ago, 6% of foreign nationals who were not allowed to vote voted. You ready for this? 81% of them voted for Obama. So if you have any questions, that should answer all of those as to why this, that we're now racist and suppressionists for trying to stop this. Um, our DMVs have turned out to get up, turned into get out the vote organizations who assist both uh, residents who are here, uh, excuse me, uh, alien citizens who are here lawfully, because some are here lawfully, but they still can't vote, and the ones who are here illegally. Uh, there's a little poster. It's real cute. It's a poster in the Wisconsin DMVs. It's hanging on the wall when you walk in the Wisconsin DMV. And it says, don't have an ID? No problem. You can still vote. Yeah, cute. Doesn't, doesn't mention citizenship in there anywhere, but they are really pushing. So I think we, we keep joking one of our projects for 2025 is get the GOTV out of the DMV. So hopefully we can do that. Um, state constitutions address citizen voting. Some of them are better than others. There is a huge movement afoot now to make sure that every state constitution has only in it. One would think that that was a distinction without a difference when it says you know, uh, like Virginia, I think it says citizens of Virginia and the United States can vote. It doesn't say only. Again, this is, this is a problem that we have that we really need to think about. So why does this matter and, um, you know, what does it mean for, for people like, like us? Uh, even if you're not ele uh, directly engaged in election activity. And before I say that, I want to say when I wrote this, I did not realize that I was speaking to a room full of naturalized citizens. Here's a boatload of, God bless every last one of you. It takes $10,000-ish, 10 years-ish, 500 phone calls to the completely incompetent State Department to get your citizenship now. So every person, and, and let's look at the history of the United States. Women didn't vote till 1919. Blacks did not receive the right to vote under the Emancipation Proclamation. They had to fight for it for 100 years. In my lifetime, the 1965 Civil Rights Act was passed, and that was when black Americans first felt comfortable actually voting and registering to vote. So every non-citizen or anyone who passed a ballot unlawfully in this country is stealing from those people. So we're already getting attacked because we are promoting the national uh, the legislation on Capitol Hill called the SAVE Act, which solves this problem from the federal level. We're already beco becoming racist, and I just laugh because I think to myself, racist? Well, what about our African-American brothers and sisters who have fought so hard for this? You have a foreign national voting and stealing one of their votes? That, to me, that's racist. So anyway, so everything happens at the ballot box. Everything you care about in this room, no matter what it is, it happens at the ballot box. And I have this conversation with people all the time. It's like, oh, well, we don't really want to do election integrity because they think it's political, but it's not. It is absolutely not. We advocate for every voter, every ballot of every party, every time. doesn't matter. Um, so school choice happens at the ballot box. Tax credits, Second Amendment rights, ballot box. Protecting the unborn, ballot box. Regulatory sand, sandboxes and freeing entrepreneurs, constitutional amendments, it all happens at the ballot box. If any of you are Virginians and you just paid attention to what happened in your last legislative session, or if you're somewhere else and you paid attention in your last legislative session, you know exactly what I'm speaking of. Uh, the ballot box determines whether your champions go there to your capital or not. So it really does make a, a huge difference. All right, so for fun, Let's circle back to my boys here and uh, the military oath that I talked about earlier. So we're in the car after the ceremony, and of course Connor and Mitchell are ribbing each other about Connor is saying, yeah, the Air Force where they send people out where no one matters in the middle of a desert. And my son, uh, son number two, is saying, oh, yeah, well, you're in the peeling potatoes brigade. So I mean, it was a lot of fun in the car. But 
the boys were commenting on the meaning of their oath. And, and one of the reasons that we were talking about it is because son number one didn't go through ROTC. So we had what we realized afterwards were all these secular graduation, which was fine. You know, when he became a lieutenant, when he became a captain, his commissioning, all that stuff. Very secular, very army. Mitchell, on the other hand, graduates from Liberty. It's all about serving God by serving your country. And even the five-star general doesn't trump the Bible. And all these speakers talked about all this stuff. And, and we just sort of realized this because my son Connor said, wow, there was something that was different about this graduation, uh, this commi uh, commissioning that was different from mine. And we realized that was what it was. And then we started talking about, I don't even know how we segued, but we started talking about what I do for a living, which again, public policy, coalition building, all that kind of stuff. And one of them said, I don't know which one, uh, mom, you know, not everybody in your bubble has taken the military oath, but these, these are your people, people who don't even realize they've taken our oath. They are the people, I think it was Connor, he said, they are the people of the oath, which is why I bring it up today, because I'm thinking to myself, as, as I'm listening to him say this, you know, that's absolutely right. You are defending the Constitution. You are fighting enemies, foreign and domestic. You are serving your country. You take that obligation freely. You're not twisting any words or twisting any documents to get there. You are gladly doing it with the sincerity that is inherent in So Help Me God. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, so now we're going we're gonna to switch to our furry friend. We're going to go out with our furry friend. You ready? There he is. All right. So the reason I bring up the furry friend is that the name of this conference is Enduring, uh, the, the tagline for uh, the settlement project is Enduring Freedom, Peace is Possible. So I'm thinking to myself, yeah, peace is possible, enduring freedom. And I thought of our friend, the quokka. Does anyone know the quokka? Do anybody recognize this cute little guy? So um, he's a cute little guy, furry guy from Australia. They live on tiny islands in the western part of Australia, and they are referred to as the happiest animal on Earth. I think partially because they smile like humans. It's kind of scary. Um, but they live in a high-trust society. Why do they live in a high-trust society? Because they have no natural predators. The value of living in a high-trust society is the freedom and the lack of stress and anxiety that comes with feeling safe and protected in your home. No one's going to attack you, or in the case of the quokka, steal your leaf. A low trust society, by contrast, creates fear, anxiety, and discord. Perhaps the bottom, bottom, bottom basis of everything we've discussed today at its core is that we're searching for a high trust society. In other words, we're searching for a quokka life. Um, as we go forward, let's strive for that. Achievable? You know, probably not. Realistically, does that make it less tantalizing to, to work toward? Absolutely not. I don't think we're all going to end up as cute as the quokkas either, but is it, it's absolutely worthy of the effort. And why? Again, circling back, because we listen to graduation. We're doing what we were told to do, and we are living those values, and we are all people of the oath. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Uh, so just to reiterate, to revisit the DC, CCP, Russian Embassy thing. So currently you're saying that they can, in fact, uh, vote in, in, in a local election. Local only. Not federal, but local. Not state. Yeah. How, for example, in DC, do they separate? I'm trying to remember, are there two separate ballots? There are two separate ballots. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so, the cost of the taxpayers. Yeah. Okay. And what's your set? And how many states is that the case? Um, there are none. None of that is happening statewide anywhere. Uh, I think oh, uh, there's one city in, in California that does it, and I don't want to say it. What state? In, what city? One city in California. New York also does it. And there's currently a lawsuit in New York. Um, the, the argument was that the city council wanted a certain cohort of individuals who had come into the city to be able to vote, and there is currently a uh, lawsuit from the Public Interest Law Foundation. Uh, using African American plaintiffs who are claiming standing and claiming that their votes and their civil rights, and they're absolutely right, their civil rights are being violated by the ability of a foreign national to vote in a local election.
How can a city within a state have precedence in terms of its regulations? Of, oh, I thought once within, a, within the state of Kansas or New York, would it not be a state matter? It, it should be, and that's part of the lawsuit, is that, that the local area doesn't have standing. But again, D.C. is different because it's D.C. So they passed this in their city council over the objections of the mayor, actually. Mm. And, and in Congress, New York, they just Congress did it anyway. wouldn't, uh, Congress does have the veto power over D.C. positions, right? I, I don't, that's a nuance I can't, yeah. I can't address. I don't know if they can do it. Thank you. Yeah. Let's hear it for Carrie again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Carrie will be available for, for questions uh, directly to her afterwards. And also, um, please visit the, the websites, uh, the Virginia Institute for Public Policy and the Election Integrity Network, and uh, take, up, take her up on the offer to join some of the Zoom calls, get involved, uh, donate. There's a donate button there. You can donate to the cause and support it any way you can. It's a great, it's, it's, as they say, it's the hill to die on. It's it the hill the to die on this year to now in November. And I have business cards. So and, and, yeah, business. absolutely. So yeah. please support this. This movement and this effort is really is significant, very important. We have some uh, literature, some uh, pamphlets that they're giving out at this time. Um,